Tonight I'm returning to this series of messages on the revelatory ministry of the miracles of Christ. <clears throat> if you want to behold something of the divine manner, how Jesus works, you want to kindle the candle of hope in you and strengthen your faith. We're going to see another uh, miracle tonight. The healing of the impotent man in the fifth chapter of John. John is the only one that records this particular miracle. <coughs> We're going to find that this miracle is set in a, in a holy environment. And during a holy occasion. And while Jesus was about his father's business. You don't want Jesus to have to depart from what he's doing to help you. Now the text is found in the 5th chapter of John. It's the first 16 verses. And I'll be giving a more of an overview of this. <clears throat> after this, as after Jesus turned the water into wine, after this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Will thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the, two pool, when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But when I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, Take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. And the man departed and, and told the Jews that it was Jesus which made him whole. Therefore the, did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him. Because he'd done these things on the Sabbath day. Well, quite an incident. You'll notice if you have later versions of the Scripture, the NIV leaves out the, uh, I believe it's the fourth verse, leaves it out. Because they, uh, there's a position that says there's some ancient manuscripts that don't, don't include it. But the same, uh, the same Bibles have the seventh verse, which refers to the fourth verse. So it just tells you how brilliant some people can be. The text is in the Bible. Yeah. And uh, people all through the ages have referred to this mm -hmm. from the first age. So uh, 
We don't want to let skeptics that have a hard time believing that an angel could come down and trouble the water try and talk us out of this. Amen. There are several texts of Scripture that are treated this way by later translations of the Scripture by people who are more motivated by scholarship than by faith. Now notice this setting of this, uh, this miracle because this is significant. According to the second chapter, the 13th verse, it was the Passover that was approaching, so this feast that was at hand was the Passover feast. Some significant things happened at that time. This is a sacred feast. Jesus went up to Jerusalem to be there. You do have to go up to Jerusalem. From wherever you are. Because Jerusalem was actually built on a mountain. And then the temple was built on a mountain in, up on that mountain. So the up. He went up to Jerusalem. This is Jesus' mindset now. Wherever there is people that are giving due recognition to things God has ordained, Jesus... Here's how Jesus would put it. If two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I. So wherever there's people gathered with an interest in the things of God, he's there. Now the location of this event was the sheep market. We would call it a sheep gate. And some of the later translations call it a gate. By the sheep gate, there's a big pool there. They've uncovered what they think is this pool, or not sure, but the pool they uncovered was 240 feet long and 40 feet across. Pretty good sized pool. <laughs> Had five porches or porticos, a portico or a porch or pillars and with a roof over them. Had five of them. And these five porches in the holy city by the pool Bethesda, which means house of kindness, by the sheep gate that was restored in the day of Nehemiah. Nehemiah the third chapter tells you about who built the sheep gate. It was filled with a lot of porches and people there were to be healed. I think it kind of strikes my attention is the familiarity of the writer and the familiarity <coughs> with the holy city. <laughs> Talked about the holy city. They kind of knew where things were located in the holy city. This is a kingdom mindset to know where things are located that's associated with God. These porches were filled with a lot of people, helpless people. They were impotent people. That's people that are just uh, helpless, can't help themselves. Impotent people. They were blind people that couldn't see. So there was a multitude. It's just all five of these porches just loaded down. I don't believe this is an everyday occurrence. It appears because the scripture refers to at a certain season. This happened. So somebody in there, they all sensed this was a time to get the blessing, so they all turned up there. Uh -huh. Blind people couldn't see. Halt people, we call them crippled people. Withered people, their bodies had shrunken and were paralyzed. And here they were. What a vivid picture of fallen humanity. There, <laughs> there they all are, laying in these porches. Kind of a panoramic view, a micro, uh, a macro view of humanity. Helpless and blind and crippled and withered, weak and beyond strength, and can't, unable to see God and the things of God, and crippled, so they're just hobbling through life all the time, just hobbling through life, and withered and unable to use their faculties because blighted by sin. Just a picture, a panoramic picture of humanity. They were all there waiting for something. They were waiting for the troubling of the water. It's an old hymn we used to sing about that, waiting for the troubling of the water, back when people who wrote songs knew more about the Bible than they do today. But they're waiting for the troubling of the water. And something unusual would happen, causing the water to be agitated and stirred. And the water was calm in this case. There wasn't a lot of hope when the water began moving. Hope was kindled. Now that's the proper posture for God's people. Waiting for something to happen. It's a manner now. We're seeing a man of the kingdom. Proverbs the 8th chapter verse 34 says, Blessed is the man that hears me watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors, waiting for me to do something. 
Solomon's personifying wisdom in the text, but Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. He's the one who some blesses this the person who's waiting for Christ to do something. Anticipating it, getting it in the place where it's most apt to happen. These people just didn't go out into the desert in their own place and look for something to happen. They went where something was more apt to happen. Kind of was a history of things happening here, evidently. Lamentations 3, 26 said, It is good for a man, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of God. So there they were, this multitude, just quietly waiting. And uh, if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Romans 8, 25, so this is the proper posture. This is the kind of environment now Jesus can work in. Waiting. Now the scripture tells us that they were waiting for some angelic activity. That at a certain season, an angel from heaven would come down and go into the pool. We don't know if it was visible or not. But the angel would go into the pool and agitate the waters. <laughs> well, you tell someone that today, no wonder some people cut that out of the Bible. Eh? <laughs> this doesn't make sense to some people, but to those who traffic with God, this makes perfect this makes perfect sense. Personality from heaven can come down and do something on earth. You know, Revelation 16, 5 speaks of an angel that had charge of the waters. So maybe this angel had charge of this pool. And all this was just so one person could be healed. Whoever got in first, that never worked in a lot of churches I've been in. That never worked. That never worked. Because people sit in the back. Hmm? These people on the porches weren't in the back. Here's how it went. When this angel troubled this water, the first one in got healed, and everybody else laid back on the porch. See, that's a foolish thing to the world, isn't it? <laughs> but here's what the Scripture says about the foolish things of God. Who, who, among, who among church folk would ever devise a plan like that? Huh? A plan where once in a while, every season, maybe this was a Passover, there was a season, I don't know, but it was at some season, there's a chance for one person, of a multitude of people, there's a chance for one person to be healed. This wouldn't offer much hope to some people, but here's how these people were thinking, it could be me. That's how you think. When you think about the great power of God and what He can do, you can think, it might be me. <laughs> I'm going to be front and center. Be one of the first. 1 Corinthians 1.25 says, The foolishness of God is wiser than men. So this would be, in human estimation, a very foolish way to do something. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And it is going to confound some wise people in this text here. They're not going to be able to discern it. So those who are alert were alert. They knew what was going on at this pool. See, the word got around. So if it's true that only one person was healed, and that's what the text says, that first one in, whoever this was over a period of time, that first person in had broadcast what had happened, and people had seen what had happened, and everyone got to hope that they could be the one person. Now, in the day of salvation, we've got a whosoever will thing now. Yeah. It's a lot bigger. But if people if people gather at a pool hoping just one, what should people do today when everybody can get in? See? Yeah. Marvelous picture of the of the kingdom of God. Now let's look at the situation here. There's a specific man there that's singled out. Out of the multitudes, it says there was a multitude, and here's one man, zero in on one person, and he's been 38 years dominated by this illness of impotence. 38 years. According to sight, now, physically, he might have looked like other people physically, because it says there was a lot of impotent folks. He might, on the surface, have looked like everybody else, but, but God doesn't look on things according to to appearance. Amen. Jesus is going to see beneath the appearance here of this man. You can believe that if you're in a group of people at any time, 
where in your heart you feel as though perhaps you're a bit more serious or a bit more devoted to the multitude of people. And maybe it's a little disappointing to you because no one seems to be troubling the water where you are. You just remember that your, your seriousness and your tenderness of heart is not overlooked by Jesus. Amen. He sees this. And this day may very well have been the only person there that day that had the kind of faith Jesus was looking for. You remember that the Lord told Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 7, that the or Lord told him, the Lord looks not on the countenance. He said, don't you look at the man who was there to anoint the next king of Israel, who was David. He said, look not at the countenance or the height of his stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And this is what we find right here. The Lord looking on the heart. Jesus himself said, don't judge according to appearance. Incidentally, men use this, this uh, reasoning. They'll say something like this. You can't judge a book by its cover. Invariably, what they mean is, I'm really better than I look. That isn't how Scripture uses this at all. Mm -hmm. What Scripture means is, you could be worse than you. Yeah. It's just exactly the opposite. It says, don't judge according to appearance. Do you look after the things of the outward appearance, Paul said? No, don't, don't, don't do that. Could be a lot better. A lot better. God sees beneath our heart that things are better. Now let's look at this a little more, a little more closely. The presence of Jesus now alters this situation. But here's the situation. You've got a multitude of impotent folk. One person in particular that the scripture sort of puts a telescope on, brings them up close. But the presence of Jesus is going to alter this whole situation. Yeah. See, Jesus' work are done in the network or framework of perception. Jesus moves by what he sees that's beneath, uh -huh. beneath the surface. Now, Jesus comes on the scene. This is going to be a lot better than an angel trouble in the water. Okay, that's something you can kind of see. This is going to be kind of un... It's not going to get a lot of attention like a trouble in the water would get. He's going to, he's going to go about it a bit differently. Now the scriptures tell us about God's manner here in dealing with the, with the prophet Elijah. 1 Kings 19, 11 and 12. The prophet was told, Go stand upon the mount before the Lord. Now, this was a high mount, Mount Sinai, where it was going to be, is where it was. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. Uh, but the Lord was not in the wind. Mm -hmm. And after the wind, an earthquake. Uh, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. Uh, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. That's what he was in. Now, compared to the angel trouble in the water, what's going to happen here is like a still, small voice. Mm -hmm. It appears as though this man is kind of the only one that really knew what was going on. It's what he didn't shout at him from the exterior. He came to him and he asked him if... Scripture says he saw him. His eyes like fastened on him. And he came to this man. He asked him a question. He said, do you want to get well? How's that? You think, well, of course. What he's here for. Well, Jesus doesn't take that for granted. He doesn't take for, take for granted because you're here. You want to be fed. He doesn't take that for granted. He doesn't take for granted because you name the name of Christ, you want, to, you want blessing from above. He doesn't take that for granted. He's going to ask you, what? Do you want to get well? See that man that we met, Peter and John, at the gate, beautiful? He asked alms. And he, and he didn't expect to get well. He didn't expect to get well. He expected he was going to receive some money from him. 
Pete, you have to tell them we don't have any money. I knew right there he wasn't a TV preacher. That became, he wasn't that. We knew right away. It says silver and gold have I none. Yeah. That man received something he didn't expect that day. We're going to find out this man didn't expect anything either. He was there, and he's going to explain later to Jesus. He really he knew nothing was going to happen from the trouble in the water. He kind of wondered why he was there. But well, Jesus is going to reward him. Now the Lord asked questions like this: What do you want? Not, there's not been a lot of people that he uh, has said this to. But he wants to draw out of people. Faith has to be drawn out of people. Mm -hmm. And the Lord has a way of doing it. Sometimes he draws draw faith out of people by troublous circumstances. He can draw it out by an exhortation. He can draw it out by a proclamation. But he's got a way of drawing faith out. Mm -hmm. You think of what uh, God said to Abraham. He said, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is it? Mm -hmm. Are you troubled about your circumstance? Are you? The Lord's going to ask you, now, is anything too hard for me? Is it? It's amazing how the human mind and flesh it tends to skirt the issues. And think, yeah, but, and what if, and is anything too hard for the Lord? God pressed Abraham, you tell me, is this too hard for me? Is this too hard for me, for your barren, aged wife to have a child through you who's impotent yourself? Is this really too hard for me? Well, I like the kind of question. No. Jeremiah, hundreds of years later, same question. Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Is there? You know, you've got to answer that question. And this is not, you can't answer it by, with a, by some kind of a creedal answer. Well, we believe that that's not what he's looking for. Right. He wants to know if a person in his heart thinks this is really too difficult. A person may concoct all kind of answers to this and say, well, the Lord doesn't do that anymore, or maybe the Lord's not willing to do that, or that's not the question. He didn't ask, do you think I'm willing to do this? That's not what he asked. He said, do you think I, I'm able to do this? Is this too hard for me? Now here's a question that he asked <coughs> some blind men. Called out for him, called out for him, called out for him. He stopped. And he called him to them and he, to himself and he said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? What, what do you want? Mm -hmm. And they had the answer. Another time, in Mark 10, 51, he has the, same, has the same question. What should I do unto thee? Now, if Jesus says to come to you right now and ask you the question, what do you want me to do? You've got to spend some time thinking. What would you say? What do you want me to do? Would you say, Lord, I need some milk money. That's it. That's what I need. What would you say if he said, what do you want me to do? This is God Almighty talking now, who has all power in heaven and earth. Would you say, well, I, I, I don't have enough gas money. Is that what you say? Something to think about. Each person has to sort of think this out themselves. But I've done a considerable amount of thinking on this. And I've come to the conclusion that I need to ask bigger things. He asked him, do you want to be made, do you want to, want to be made well? Now the man, he doesn't really answer the question. He doesn't say, well, yes, I do. He doesn't say it because he tells you later he didn't know who was talking to him. He didn't know who this was. We're going to find he was more responsive to someone he didn't know than some people are to people they do know. But he said, well, where's my situation? When the water gets to trouble, nobody will help me. You know, see, people dead in trespasses and sins, they're not too mindful of one another. <laughs> if you know, they're not too mindful of one another. They said, somebody just step over him to get in. They didn't care about him. They said, they just step over me and they get in first. I can't, I can't get there. See, well, why didn't he get closer to the pool? Well, 
people like that probably wouldn't let him get close to the pool. He looked helpless. He looked, there's really nothing can be done about my situation. That's what he's saying. Here, I am here. I'm as close as I can get, but I'm pretty well shut up to this that someone's going to beat me in there, and I'm not going to get in. Helpless. Well, this happens to be God's manner. God brings people to a point where there isn't really any help anywhere else. If you're banking on somebody else, Helping you, there you'll find them. They're, they're seeking for themselves first, ahead of you. But that doesn't mean that you really have no help coming to you. Now here's what the scripture says about God's manner. I want to show here how that this is how God works. God shuts off all other help. This is one of His manners. Deuteronomy 32:36 says, "The Lord will judge His people." And repent himself for his servants when, when, when he sees that their power is gone and there's none shut up or left. Then's when God begins to. Amen. Work. That's it. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, it just could very well be as long as there's some other resources available to you, God waits. To be gracious. Now the truth of the matter is there really isn't anybody else to help. That is really the truth of the matter. But you've got to see it. Amen. And what God does, He just dries up all the resources. They just fall off. There's none, none there. Nobody to help you find it back against the wall. None to help. Mm -hmm. Then God, then here comes Jesus mm -hmm. walking toward you at the pool. Here's another. Psalm 72 verse 12. He shall deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. Mm, that's good. Again, Psalm 142, 4. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Then here comes the master walking into the poolside. Or let's put it this way, Romans 5, 6. When we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Now this is God's manner. You really, Amen. You really want to see this. Man must be brought to see this, that this is just not a doctrinal stance. When Jesus said, without me you can do nothing, that is precisely the case. Amen. When Paul said, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, that is precisely the case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you right up front that in our age, this is a difficult truth to get hold of. In a highly technological age where people have a lot of the answers, and you and you if you've got some kind of a health problem, you've got all kind of people. One person will say it's in the brain, we've got to get the right way. Go into your brain. Another person says, in your back. Can I get your back straightened out? That's what it is. Another guy says, it's in your foot. Got to get the thing. Nerves in your foot. Another person says, it's diet. It's what you eat. That's it. Another person says, it's deficiency of vitamins. That's what it is. There's a thousand people out there that have the answer. But the truth of the matter is that at some point, if you want help from God, you got to come to the point where you know there isn't anybody else. Amen. That's where this man, Amen. that's the point he was at. Great truth yeah. to see. And you see the inconsideration of others there. So if you put the trust in man, man comes to a point where he's number one and forgets about you. Uh -huh. But God is number one and doesn't forget about you. Amen. How's that? Shows how sinful man is. When man thinks of himself as being primary, he forgets everybody else. God, who is primary, remembers everybody. What a truth. Now the master alters the situation with his word. And that is a sign of real power when your word is potent. So he gives the man three things to do. Rise. Get up. That's the first one. Get up. Second, take up your bed. Third, start moving. Well, well, actually, that's the way it is. When God works with you, <laughs> that's the way it is. So you, uh, 
Maybe you've been debilitated. Your strength is gone. You may you feel as though you're helpless. You first thing first thing is get up. That's the first thing. Get up. Stand up. Shake yourself. Second thing, you take charge of the thing that took charge of you. And the third is start moving. Now see, none of those things are possible outside of Christ. If, if anybody but Jesus would have said that, nothing would have happened. That's right. <laughs> it's not just the, it's just not the, it's not a saying. This isn't a magical saying that if anybody says that it happens, the right person has to say it. Amen. You know, there's people today that are trying to mimic Jesus. Mm -hmm. They're actually trying to mimic him. They're commanding things to happen, but they aren't happening. Why not? Because they don't have the power. But Jesus does have the power. <coughs> and the response, as you notice, was immediate. Immediately. He got up, picked up his bed, and started walking. Immediately. We mentioned this before, but this is the man of the, of the kingdom. <coughs> the man healed a le Jesus healed a leper in Matthew 8, 3. It says immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Immediately. When a blind person, he touched their eyes, blind men, he touched their eyes, says immediately their eyes received sight. Mark 1, 31, the fever of Peter's mother-in-law, he rebuked the fever and immediately the fever left her. So I'm showing you what can happen when Jesus works. Mm -hmm. This is not, tell, this is not the kind of text where you, you analyze what's happened to you. Mm -hmm. That's not why this is written. This is written to show you what Jesus can do. And your faith has got to get into Him. Yeah. Not in your diagnosis of what's happened to you. This is how Jesus can work. And He still works in this manner. Again in Mark 2.12 to another impotent man, He said immediately He rose, took up His bed. Blind men following Jesus again in Mark 10.52. It says immediately He received His sight. Followed Jesus. Jesus touched him in his mouth was opened immediately. See, this is how this is how the situation responds. All that remains is for Jesus to speak. It just has to be that he speaks to your situation. That woman had touched the hem of Jesus' garment. When she touched the border of